Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third Young Professional Summit, day two. Uh, we have lined up uh, a few great speakers again. It was the first time that we're organizing it online. Uh, the benefit is that we can welcome you from all over the world. Um, so we would like to inform you that this session is being recorded and might be used later uh, on our uh, media channels. Uh, I would like to ask you to switch off your uh, microphone and camera to spare the bandwidth for those with a poor connection. So uh, the, the YP Summit is organized by three associations. It's EAG, PSGB and uh, SPE. So it's a collaborative event uh, by multiple societies. We all have a special interest group for young professionals and students. Uh, the EAG uh, interest group is free for uh, EAG members and non-members as well. I'd like to welcome you to uh, to join the group, and we will be sharing the details later on as well for the uh, for the group. If you are not an EAG member yet and you are a student, um, please be aware that the first year of EAG membership is for free now. I'd like to give the word to word to Adam. To start the day. Perfect. Thank you very much, Karin, for this introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I knew it was very hard to battle that alarm clock. My myself, you had to drag myself and have to at least one sneeze uh, before I could get up. Uh, as Karin said, my name is Adam, Adam Zalewski. I'm a petroleum engineer at BP, but I'm here representing one of the three organizations that is colonizing the YC Summit, which is Society of Petroleum Engineers. Uh, what is a YP Summit? It's basically an effort from the young professionals for young professionals to create an event for you that kind of focuses on the uh, topics that would interest people just entering in the industry and looking for a long, long uh, career within it. Uh, today's session is focused just about that. Uh, the title is Multidisciplinary Career Opportunities. And we have three fantastic speakers that will give you an insight into what the career is and what future endeavors we would see within it. Uh, I will do my best to keep us on time uh, just because we need to fit this in into our working lives and etc. So happy to if you write your questions in uh, at the start when we have a point in time where we can take questions after a presentation, I will ask you to to ask it yourself, but I will as well try to keep us on schedule. Uh, so we finish in time. At the end of today, we will have a conclusion and discussion. So every question that we kind of park, we can pick up there and have the whole panel of speakers uh, to discuss it, or we can pick up new topics. You know, when you get all those fantastic presentations, if there's something that comes to your mind, uh, keep it in for that last session. If you would, it being asked to the entire uh, panel. Uh, in addition to that, uh, ground rules, as we discussed, if if we want to preserve bandwidth, you know, um, keep camera off if you're speaking. But if you're asked to speak, camera would really help us to get that personal connection with somebody and understand who our audience is and who's asking questions. Uh, so that's it. Uh, that's kind of the introduction that I had in hand. I think we can uh, slowly start and get some. Uh, time back. So our first speaker of today is Artem Kashubin. He is the senior geophysicist at PetroTrace, and he will speak to us about optimizing the geoscience workflow. So who is Artem? Artem is a senior geophysicist in PetroTrace. As I said, he has graduated from the Ural State Academy of Mining and Geology in Russia with a degree in geophysical engineering and he holds a PhD from the from Uppsala University, Sweden. He has worked as a researcher across many universities, including Uppsala University, Imperial College London, and Schlumberger Cambridge Research, where he developed new techniques for imaging for the seismic, new seismic sensors, and data fusion. He is a paper author, co-authoring over 20 papers and three patent applications. He participated in light seismic services in Russia, Europe, South Africa, and the Middle East. He processed commercial seismic data for industry and research institutions covering various geological environments. 
He was teaching seismic techniques to petrol geoscience MSc students, and he's on the board of the EAG Local Chapter London. I would like to welcome Art and Kashubing to the stage to tell us more about optimizing the geoscience workflow. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I'm sharing my slides now, but I will keep my camera off to preserve the bandwidth. Uh, can you please confirm if you can hear me well and if you can see my first slide? I can hear you well and I can see your first slide. Very good. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the Young Professional Summit. My name is Artem Kashubin. And here on the title, you can see the list of my co-authors, which is David Curia, Yuri Davidenko, Ivan Priyazhev. But uh, of course, the primary author and uh, the main driver of this work was Paul Beacon, who designed these slides for Amsterdam meeting scheduled for June 2020. That meeting was postponed to December last year, and the young professional session, which initially intended to be within this meeting, is ongoing just now, some 18 months later. Unfortunately, Paul passed away last summer, and this talk is a tribute to his initiative and to his legacy. Paul's prolific career is summarized in first break article in October 2020 issue. I encourage you to read it. With this talk, we are extending Paul's legacy and bridging his career with yours, the new generation of young professionals. The extended version of this talk is published in first break issue from June 2020. And if you want more details or references of this talk, please check it up. So it's called From Data Conditioning, Depth Imaging and Reservoir Characterization to Machine Learning by Paul Viking and Co-authors. First break 2020. Now to the substance of this talk, a geoscience workflow. We are emitting the data acquisition part here. Otherwise, the workflow may include the following steps: data conditioning, depth imaging with various methods, non-seismic data, joint inversion of different data sets. Reservoir characterization with conventional approaches like AVO and petrophysics, like quantitative inversion, and also new emerging artificial intelligence and machine learning methods. In the following slides, I will guide you through these steps. Health and safety first. Of course, it is more important during the field work, but even at home, office or during the party time, uh, your activities must always be carried out under most optimal safety conditions. Like in this picture, in the example of a nasty home safety fatality, a pitank ball occurred in barbecue and resulted in death of a 31 year old man. Not in the field, not in the office, that happened during a very casual activity. So always remember the motto of any technical industry, safety first. Now, presuming you safely acquired your field data, first thing you do is quality control them, QC. Quality control and data conditioning is obligatory through the workflow. Amplitude preserved processing is required when reservoir characterization is the objective. Quality control is often carried out in different domains like time space domain, tau p, Fourier, can be curvelet or any other domain. The purpose is to make sure that we are starting from the valid input and checking the integrity of the data after every essential processing step. It is a valid statement to say that for all geophysical studies, your result can be only um, as good as your inputs. Always check your input data, make sure consistency is maintained. Do proper data conditioning under the modeling assumptions. Otherwise, 
there is a risk to get trash out if you put trash in. Depth imaging is quite essential part of seismic studies. Depth imaging or migration is a procedure that positions the process seismic reflection travel time data set into its subsurface origin. In essence, it uh, converts data from the observational time domain to the image depth domain, if we are talking about depth imaging. There, uh, there is a number of well-established algorithms for performing this procedure, all based on some assumptions and simplifications of the seismic energy propagation in subsurface. Uh, more accurate algorithms uh, certainly require more compute resources and uh, hence uh, more expensive. On the cheaper side of the range are ray tracing techniques of Kirchhoff and beam migrations, wave equation based methods, including full wafer inversion or FWI and the reverse time migration or RTM are significantly more expensive. RTM permits better imaging in complex areas and is normally done for a limited frequency range. The higher the include frequencies, the more costly the computations are, but the higher the final resolution is. An advantage of the full waveform method is that it is able to predict and image all modalities of seismic energy present in the data. Um, these events like direct arrivals, guided waves, refracted diving waves, reflections, diffractions, they all can be modeled with this approach. Acoustic simplification or acoustic wave equation is not uh, taking into account elastic energy that can be widely uh, presented in seismic data as shear or S waves. Uh, if we consider a more exact description of the world and ruling out the acoustic simplification and we can employ elastic wave propagation. So in this case, uh, we can model the shear and converted waves, converted energy, which converts from compressional to shear energy. As we can see in this example of synthetic data from the realistic 2D Marmusi model, both P and S wave velocities that are required for modeling are shown. And the elastodynamic full waveform modeling is able to simulate compressional shear and converted arrivals. On the ray tracing algorithms, choice of the imaging algorithm depends on geological objectives and acquisition parameters and your budget. In some cases, a conventional Kirchhoff image is good enough. So as an example here in the central panel, Um, in some complex areas with uh, poorly defined reflections, we can use more sophisticated ways like this uh, common reflection angle migration or CRAM, which is carried out in a local angle domain. It's uh, one sort of uh, beam migration. This algorithm may provide better result as it enhances primary events and the result has better continuity of the reflections in the poorly eliminated zones. A progressively evolving depth imaging workflow may start from well data logs used for initial velocity model building. Then uh, it's very useful to implement long offset and wide azimuth data in this initial model building stage, uh, which can be crucial for extracting initial velocity. Uh, this information is carried out in the first arrivals of the refracted wave. So the long offsets are quite important there. Uh, once the initial model is there, it is updated by reflection tomography with isotropic assumptions first. Can be updated with uh, more expensive FWI methods. In case we have additional information, some prior knowledge of the area, that for example, we have uh, legacy models from the area or from the neighboring areas, 
uh, we can uh, progress towards using more accurate and more uh, complex models, including anisotropy, for instance. So talking about anisotropy, uh, the simplest uh, way, uh, the simplest type of symmetry is vertical symmetry, which is so-called VTI or vertically transverse isotropic media, assuming vertical symmetry in geological layering, or it can be HTI, assuming horizontal symmetry, or TTI, referring to tilted transverse isotropy. If available, multi-component data should be used at this step for estimation of thermographic model building. Uh, these will help to um, determine slow and fast velocity principal directions. After several iterations of uh, thermographic model building, the model will be finalized by well calibration. And migration, uh, once we have the model, then uh, migration parameters like aperture size, anti-aliasing parameters, dominant frequencies will be tested before the final production grade migration will take place. Once it's done, uh, we output several volumes, including full angle stack, near, mid, and far <clears throat> offset stacks, as well as azimuthal stacks, AVO, intercept, and gradient volumes, uh, which will be delivered to the next team. And this next team will work on uh, reservoir characterization using these uh, provided volumes. A couple of words about VTI, uh, vertical transverse isotropy. In practice, anisotropic effects are very subtle and can be observed only at far offsets um, or at uh, wider reflection angles. In this CDP gather, so here in the in the left panel, the near and uh, mid offsets are aligned well even before the anisotropic correction applied. Flattening of that far offset bits of the reflection events require estimation of the Thomson's delta and epsilon correction parameters. Once applied, these improve alignment on the farthest offset as well. So as we can see here, the entire event becomes much flatter. Therefore, when stuck, it will be more coherent. Uh, if we have wide azimuth data available, uh, in the wide azimuth observations, it's possible uh, to sort uh, migrated data according to the azimuths. So in this case, if we have any azimuthal anisotropy, we'll have these uh, sinusoidal variations that will indicate faster velocity in a particular direction. That will be a manifestation of the HTI anisotropy phenomena. So in order to get a better image, we need to correct for that phenomena. So otherwise the image will be not optimal. And of course, uh, more advanced geophysical algorithms require more resources, more computational power, more money, more time. It is longer and more expensive to acquire multi-component or wide azimuth long offset seismic data. Economical viability and time constraints are the factors that determine what data will be acquired and uh, which advanced imaging and velocity model building algorithms will be used. Obviously, there is no sense to get the best possible result at any cost. The objective is to get an optimal result with the available resources. Not overdo it, just do it as optimal as required. A uh, few words about other <clears throat> methods, other geophysical methods uh, apart from seismic. Uh, electric resistivity information is very useful as it helps to distinguish between the water bearing and hydrocarbon bearing formations. Resistivity is either measured with wireline locally in wells or with the electromagnetic surveys over the area. These can be obtained onshore or offshore and the 
the base, the motivation here is that hydrocarbons have high resistivity, which helps to delineate the presence or delineate sweet spots, preferred pathways, bypassed areas, and determine and better determine injection patterns. To get resistivity properties from field measurements requires solving inverse problem. Inversion result is not unique, uh, meaning that it's always uh, exists a family of equivalent models that can explain observations equally well. It's easy to obtain lateral location of anomalies while a depth is usually less constrained, as in this uh, simple synthetic example with the target object located at 300 meters depth in the in the shell case and at three kilometer depth in the deep case. So the electromagnetic response looks identical. So it's better to use a joint inversion approach if we have additional data to have more constraints that will limit the number of solutions and will narrow down the model space. Get a better solution of our subsurface. So a dedicated electromagnetic acquisition setup uh, may meet specific study requirements to obtain whatever is desired, desired resolution or discrimination power. Or for instance, if we want to facilitate interwell monitoring and to help mitigate potential drawbacks. A guided inversion with additional constraints improves their discrimination power as well. Resistivity anomalies are defined against a background trend and uh, used to the risk map structure in hydrocarbon exploration, but mostly for the metal prospecting. The induced polarization attribute is quite diagnostic in the metal ore mining industry. Uh, it gives more information than only resistivity. So in this example, electromagnetic data acquired for mineral mining prospecting in northern Kazakhstan. So here in the left in image A. It's a polarization map at the depth of 500 meter, which is based on the 3D inversion. You see that the conjugate faults, uh, conjugate faulting uh, controls the outline of the mapped anomalies. Uh, whilst the mineralization took place along fracture trends. We know from the from the geological observation that the MN17 MN, uh, well reached the top of the anomaly and showed copper uh, molybdenum mineralization hosted by the shear zone. On the right, we have two sections, the resistivity section and induced polarization section. And we see that the resistivity shows a better la lateral resolution while um, induced polarization uh, sections gives a better lateral constraint of the ore body. So induced polarization gives more information than only resistivity. And this is the basis for joint inversion or joint uh, utilization of the geophysical observations. Uh, here's another example uh, where we have uh, additional constraints uh, which can uh, drastically increase the re resolution of the uh, electromagnetic uh, method. So in this example, seismic uh, has provided the uh, structural grid. Uh, so seismic has provided detailed subsurface structure that was used. Uh, as a prior constraint to the electromagnetic inversion, which has to update initial resistivity model only according to the geometry of the seismic structure. So all this layering, they were predefined by seismic and then filled up, uh, the resistivity information was filled up by the electromagnetic inversion. Uh, here, resistivity changes over time. So we have um, observation before and after injection. And the successful water flooding uh, to well one and three, this image with preferential west east flow direction is indicated by the low resistivity zone. So which says that the conductivity, the flow path is quite good here after well ejection. 
after well ejection uh, resistivity decreased. Uh, joint inversion narrows down the solution space, and that increases the reliability of the studies. Multiphysic combines reflection seismic, FWI, magnetic telluric, control source electromagnetic data sets, and others available. It results in better velocity model, which in turn results in a better image, and more accurate interpretation, fracture detection, and mapping. And that in turn will lead to a more accurate predictions and better financial outcomes. Another example here, this is the Barents Sea, where the uh, control source electromagnetic adds color to the seismic. High resistivity spots indicate presence of hydrocarbons. Here's a very nice example. And joint inversion resulted in better focusing and high discrimination power of this method when used jointly. A few words on a reservoir characterization part. We have several techniques in the toolbox for reservoir characterization. Attribute analysis and spectral decomposition, analysis of P and S waves, impedance, anisotropy, eta, epsilon, delta parameters. We can employ shear wave splitting, VPVS ratio, and ABA intercept gradients, corresponding trends. So, reservoir engineering employs iterative updating loop using petrophysical templates to, um, to understand seismic response and to use this response to predict rock metrics and uh, fluid saturation properties. Uh, fluid replacement, uh, replacement modeling with uh, adjustment equation is often uh, performed in a feedback loop basis and is supported by the time lapse observation. As in this example, in the time lapse reservoir monitoring, uh, the, the difference between the base and uh, monitoring surveys is analyzed. Production of hydrocarbons and their replacement with water results both in seismic impedance change, and that will lead to amplitude changes in the seismic images, and also it will lead to alterations of seismic velocity, and that will result in time shifts between the seismic volumes. So the difficulty there is to separate the genuine production changes from 4D noise, that is usually uh, the genuine uh, production which are happening due to the actual physical changes in the reservoir from the 4D noise uh, that is usually present due to the difference in um, position or environmental conditions. Noise, uh, ambient uh, uh, activity and so on. So once we were able to identify this 4D noise and uh, suppress it, the timeline seismic uh, time-lapse seismic um, response can be used for flow simulation and for assessment of the uh, reservoir properties, which can be incorporated into static and dynamic modeling with feedback loops involving up and down scaling. A few words on a new, relatively new uh, neural network and uh, artificial intelligence methods. So I will show just a few examples here. Uh, machine learning and uh, nonlinear correlation methods uh, have a great potential for subsurface resource evaluation. Uh, new computing technology allows big data to be analyzed in a convenient way. Nonlinear correlation techniques uh, allow for a better fit between observed and model data. As in this figure, we see that the uh, predicted data in the shown in black nonlinear are uh, better following the observed uh, well known data. Uh, deep machine learning uses several hidden layers um, in the neural network. The scheme can be recursive, including feedback loops. Training could be non-supervised or supervised. In this example here in the left panel, a neural network was used for classification task. Different seismic phases are distinguished in near, mid, and far offsets. 
12 classes were used in the non-supervised neural network classification. And these classes allow to examine ABO effect. On the right hand side, uh, where the supervised approach uses 1041 scenarios of the synthetic traces. From these synthetic traces, 10 master traces were extracted and they were used for classifying the real seismic volume. The range of outcomes for the various classes makes possible a probabilistic uncertainty analysis. Uh, in this example of the edge detection, uh, machine learning was used for fault edge detection using the dynamic time warping algorithm. Uh, the method is based on similarity detection with multiple search directions between nine numbering traces. So uh, in contrast to the Euclidean orthogonal search, which is one to one match, this uh, dynamic time warping um, accounting for the neighboring locations in the vicinity of the point of interest. And this uh, was facilitated by the machine learning algorithms after training on the synthetic examples. So this uh, dynamic time warping attribute cube uh, was created and then it was fed into the standard ant uh, tracking algorithm to improve the uh, trackability of the discontinuities. In the right image here, the, delina the delineation of the fractures is better than uh, in the left, which uh, in the left one, uh, that is based on the conventional variance attribute. And these uh, results were checked by blind well control. And uh, these were successful as the delineated fractures observed in their wells. Uh, exactly where they were confirmed by the logs and by the, the core samples. And these were the few examples of using these uh, new machine learning technologies. And uh, concluding the talk on integrated approach with iterative updating of the reservoir, uh, I can summarize that optimizing their workflow uh, requires an integrated multidisciplinary effort. Quantitative interpretation is only possible with an amplitude preserved seismic processing sequence. The velocity attribute can be available asset for the interpreter. And if possible, it's recommended to use full waveform inversion modeling because it accounts for more accuracy and uh, more geological heterogeneities. Uh, migration should incorporate anisotropy effects, even when possible, when the dips are small. And interpretation is best done on the depth imaging outputs as artifact and distortions are less there in comparison, in contrast to the time domain. Pre-stack, amplitude versus offset or amplitude versus angle attributes and simultaneous inversion is done for reservoir characterization so we can use cross plotting and better physical templates uh, which gives a better understanding of seismic uh, response and influence of uh, various parameters and attribute analysis helps with uh, fascist delineation and uh, geobody and identification and delineation which is useful for 3d visualization and geological interpretation uh, interaction between the static and dynamic earth model in comparison iterative feedback loop. So all this workflow is even thought that here it is pictured as linear. We need to remember that there is no perfectness and it is an iterative process with a feedback loop implemented. If we have multi-component data sets, it will help to predict fractures and uh, principal directions of the fast and slow velocity directions, which also in turn will uh, help us uh, on interpreting geological um, tectonic uh, settings and geological history of the area. And now uh, the nonlinear correlation and powerful option. Now when we have these neural network systems available to us to crunch through the big data, which are calling for efficient computing handling in real time, this data contributes as a 
new tools in our toolbox for reservoir characterization and are getting more and more available to the community. So, of course, this workflow is not exhaustive and uh, the more you want to add to the workflow, the more costly it gets, but the long-term gain should be rewarding. So, and that's the conclusion of my talk. So, at the end, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues at Wintershell Dia, Peter Trace, Gelias LLC, and Geops Consultancy for the cooperation. Uh, big thanks to my colleagues, and without their support, this project would not be materialized. And I'm telling this on behalf of Paul Wicken, who was with us till last year and who inspired and uh, initiated this talk. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm ready to answer your questions, if any. Thank you very much, Artem, for this presentation. I think we have time for one question and we can park the rest the, at the end of the session. Is there any question from the audience? If you could type it into chat or you could uh, raise your hand and then unmute yourself. You can take one question. If there's no questions, uh, I, I have a question actually. So yeah. mm -hmm. at the start of your presentation, you said that th that this important part of choosing the right algorithm for the job. But with you know the computing power increasing, would it make sense to use multiple algorithms and kind of stack them up and then use all of them at once and see what the kind of combined answer would be? Uh, well, this is a possible approach, but of course, uh, it's not only the crunching time, it's not only the mechanical time of applying these algorithms, but of course, a costly time of the interpreter to assess them. So, uh, and also another note on this side that more complex algorithms, for instance, like uh, depth imaging in the obtaining of the FWI model requires more work and more input data. So you cannot use fine tool with the poor data. So the better algorithms and more expensive algorithms require better and more expensive data. So in the case you have those, all right, no problem. But in the case you have a limited data quality or like limited azimuths or you don't have all the component data and so on and so forth, it is more practical to get kind of to progressively evolve your project from a simpler uh, algorithms which are more forgiving and based on the more simplifications in order to get some basic result first analyze it and then progressively increase complexity rather than to throw everything at once to different algorithms so this is my view brilliant thank you very much for for, for me i the big highlight is that not you need different data for different algorithms so you have a cost up up front that you have to decide to spend or not oh, yeah thank yeah. you Adam. for me for me i'm not from geophysics so that's kind of uh, enlightening all right thank you very much Artem. so it's 45 past so we are ready to start with our next uh, presentation uh the next presenter would be paulo del avasana he is a senior geophysicist and project manager at ENI, uh, Upstream and Technical Services. And what Paolo would speak to us about is cross-disciplinary machine learning. So Paolo has graduated in geology in 1988 and physics in 1996 at Naples University. Furthermore, he studied philosophy at Rome University. He has more than three decades of experience in geology and geophysics including 25 years in the hydrocarbon industry. Since 2002, Paolo is senior geophysicist and project manager at ENI, Upstream Technical Services. He is an expert in integrated geophysical methods and in data science. Since 2014, Paolo is an international lecturer. He visited the most prestigious universities around the world for a lecture tour about integrated geophysics. Paolo is author of several patents, published more than 100 papers, 
and five scientific books. In 2018, Paolo has received the ENI Award as a recognition for the best technological innovation of the year. In 2019, Paolo has been finalist at the Abu Dhabi International Petroleum Exhibition at Conference Awards for the Breakthrough Research of the Year. In addition to physics and geosciences, Paolo has many other cultural interests, including visual arts, sound engineering, music, epistemology, artificial intelligence, applied mathematics, neurosciences, and much more. Please let me welcome Paolo to the stage to speak about cross-disciplinary machine learning. Thank you, Adam, for your introduction and uh, good morning, everybody. I prepared some slides, so let me uh, share my screen. Okay, let me know if you can see it properly. Can you see it? your slides? It's not in presentation mode. Okay. Yet. Okay. That should be in presentation. Fantastic. That should work. Okay. Good. Uh, so um, today I'm going to talk about cross disciplinary machine learning. And uh, this is the agenda, the outline of my talk. After a brief introduction, I will explain the motivations of this presentation. And I will go uh, to a quick introduction about machine learning uh, using a couple of simple automatic classification examples. Then I will move uh, into the second part of the talk uh, that is the core of the talk uh, about cross disciplinary machine learning applications, again using uh, real data and uh, real examples. Uh, so let me explain the motivations of this talk. Uh, this is not a uh, strictly uh, technical presentation because I have included uh, all the technical, mathematical uh, and statistical details in these two uh, draft books that I, uh, I wrote, especially for young people. And I put, I uploaded these draft books on, on my research gate uh, page so that you can uh, download them for free. And so you can find all the details uh, about machine learnings and uh, different types of applications in these draft books. Uh, instead, the, the main goal of my talk today is to motivate, especially young people, to use machine learning for linking, bridging different fields uh, in geosciences, so including geology, um, reservoir engineering, uh, or uh, well log analysis, geophysics, but also outside the field of geosciences, as you, as you will see in the next few slides. And in this book, anyway, you can find also several uh, tutorial Python codes so that you can uh, uh, try by yourself to code in Python for combining different types of geophysical data for analyzing uh, geophysical data using machine learning. So uh, let's start with a very quick overview about machine learning. Uh, it was defined by Samuel uh, in 1959 as a subfield of artificial intelligence that provides computers the ability to automatically learn and improve from data and from experience without being explicitly programmed. This is a quite old definition, but it is still uh, valid, at least partially. And uh, uh, the, there are many objectives in machine learning, many different goals, such as mining data and discovering relationships in the data, clustering the data, and uh, uh, automatic classification, of course, probabilistic predictions of continuous outcomes, and finally, uh, from a pragmatic point of view, making better decisions. Uh, Schematically speaking, there are three main fields in uh, machine learning. So there is supervised and unsupervised learning, and then there is reinforcement learning. In supervised learning, we assume that we have uh, some uh, training data set. So uh, we assume that we have labeled part of the data, uh, for instance, using a human interpreter. 
and we use that uh, uh, training data set for uh, teaching the computer to, uh, to perform some type of task. And in supervised, uh, unsupervised learning, we uh, don't need any uh, training data set. And we uh, have a different goal. In that case, we want to cluster the data in uh, similar uh, clusters and we want to transform our information from an unstructured data set into a structured data set. Reinforcement learning is a different type of, uh, of uh, machine learning approach. It is concerned with how intelligent agents are able to take actions in their environment in order to maximize the mathematical notion of a cumulative reward. So it is a completely different approach. There is somebody who has not uh, unmuted the microphone, so I I I, I heard some noise in, in the background. So I suggest to uh, mute mute the microphone. Okay. Uh, okay uh, let me start with uh, some examples in order to to explain uh, the basics of machine learning going through examples. In this case, I I'm going to, um, I, I want to classify uh, rock samples using a uh, uh, chemical compositions, in particular, I'm using 11 um, different um, chemical species as attributes for classifying the data. And this is an example of a supervised uh, learning. So I want to classify my sample rocks, several, uh, several thousand of sample rocks into four different rock classes using these chemical attributes. And uh, the first step is feature engineering. This is very important in the machine learning workflow. So basically, we want to uh, map uh, the density uh, function distribution um, of the different uh, uh, classes using different types of attributes. In this case, I'm using four different mineral uh, chemical species as uh, attributes, and you can see in different colors the, the different uh, distributions of uh, the, the rock types, uh, you can understand immediately that uh, using just one uh, chemical attribute, we are not able to separate perfectly uh, the four different classes. So we need to use many different uh, attributes for proper classification because otherwise we have some overlapping between the different classes. This is very, the first very important concept uh, in machine learning. We need to use many attributes and we need to go through feature engineering uh, as a first step of our workflow. Uh, the second important concept is that we, sorry, we need to use simultaneously more than one method uh, for classifying the data. In this case, I'm using uh, in my platform, uh, in my machine learning platform here, I'm using six different classifiers, adaptive boosting, uh, decision tree, random forest, and so forth. In order to have uh, at least uh, five or six uh, classification results to be compared with each other uh, in order to verify the reliability of the final classification process. Here you can see that we have um, pretty good consistency between the different classification results, um, different colors, we have the different types of, of rocks classified based on uh, uh, my, uh, chemical, chemical species. And this is also uh, the result obtained by deep neural network that is pretty consistent with the previous uh, results. The key message uh, is to use uh, at least five or six or seven classifiers simultaneously. Uh, when you do your machine learning workflow. Let me show this other very interesting example that because it is based on a combination of uh, uh, multidisciplinary geophysical data. In this case, our geological geophysical problem is very complex because we want to define the lateral extension of hydrocarbon distribution in a very complex uh, stacked sand reservoir in a, a difficult, complex geological environment uh, that was characterized by faults uh, and also by a carbonate platform uh, before the, the, the reservoirs. And we wanted to integrate 3D seismic data, electromagnetic data, gravity data, and well logs. 
And we went through uh, simultaneous joint inversion, cooperative inversion of this type of data supported by machine learning. And we used the, uh, a lot of uh, marine controlled source electromagnetic data in this case. This is the uh, block diagram of our workflow. So we started from calibrating data and models at well location in order to create a robust and reliable um, training data set in correspondence of the, of the wells. We had uh, at that time four wells, and so we were able to build a very uh, reliable training data set around the wells. And then we wanted to use uh, that training data set for training our neural networks for classifying the remaining part of the data far away from the wells in terms of uh, a binary uh, probabilistic prediction. Uh, so our, our basic question was, do we have brine or oil at reservoir depth far away from the wells? And this was the final target of our machine learning uh, application to multi-physics data. And we went through all the steps of the workflow, including training uh, and, and uh, classification going through many different uh, algorithms in parallel. This is just one example of the results. Here we have a probabilistic map of hydrocarbons distribution at target depth, in this case in the upper reservoir. Uh, in red we have a high probability to find oil, and in blue we have brine, basically. And uh, this map is very important because this was prepared by myself and my colleagues and was published in 2012, so almost 10 years ago. And uh, we drilled uh, recently a couple of wells, an appraisal well here, another exploration well here. And uh, this was a very important discovery here, uh, an oil discovery, and this was a dry well in the southern part was a dry well. So uh, these uh, drilling results uh, fully confirmed our probabilistic uh, oil distribution map that we uh, created years before. So this is a very interesting um, uh, case of probabilistic prediction using, uh, using integrated geophysics supported by machine learning. And I published this in, in several, in several um, papers. Another example is a little fluid fashion classification from well logs. So in this case, our, our data consists of uh, uh, composite uh, logs, uh, including sonics, gamma ray, neutron logs, uh, spontaneous potentials, and so forth. Again, we started from uh, um, uh, future engineering, mapping the probability density distribution of uh, diff six different uh, little fluid uh, fashions uh, using, uh, in this case, for example, sonic logs, but we did the same also for resistivity logs and uh, the other logs. Our objective was to use all these logs for classifying automatically uh, uh, our uh, uh, data into six little fluid fashions. And uh, again, as usual, we went through uh, six or seven uh, different uh, algorithms. So uh, decision tree classifier, random forest, naive Bayes, adaptive boosting, and so forth, in order to compare the classification results that in this case are in this case are displayed in, in different colors. So each color represents a little fluid fascist uh, plotted on the resistivity log here. And uh, we can do the same also on the Sonics log, of course, and on the other logs. But here you can see that the different classification results are pretty consistent with all the different uh, classifiers. And uh, now, now I would like to move to the most interesting part of the talk because uh, it is cross-disciplinary applications. Uh, this is a very important message for young people, but not only for young people. Uh, nowadays, we need to be creative uh, uh, if we want to be uh, excellent professionals and multidisciplinary is extremely important for being creative people and machine learning can help us to be multidisciplinary and creative at the same time so machine learning allows a cross disciplinary approach to very complex problems this is the key message of my talk 
Let me start from this very interesting, uh, unusual um, application to show you how machine learning can help us to be creative and innovative in, in geosciences. In this case, I uh, tried to combine uh, the geophysical domain with the sound engineering domain. So I uh, tried to uh, transform geophysical data into musical data, into digital music. Um, and then I used the, the MIDI uh, musical attributes uh, in the machine learning workflow for classifying geophysical data. Let me explain a little bit better this process. So uh, in this uh, scheme, I explain my workflow. Basically, I start from uh, seismic data, in this case, seismic trace, and I do that for each individual seismic trace automatically. I extract a spectrogram from it. So the, I perform a spectral analysis of the seismic uh, information. And then I transform the spectrogram into a MIDI file. MIDI is a standard musical format in digital music. MIDI means musical instrument digital interface. And after doing that, I can upload my MIDI uh, seismic trace into a sequencer, a virtual musical studio, and I can play it. So you can listen to the sounds of the seismic trace transformed into a MIDI file. You can find uh, many examples of this on my YouTube uh, channel. And this is very important because after doing that, we can uh, basically, we can uh, extract MIDI attributes and we can use about uh, 100 MIDI musical attributes for classifying the seismic data in a completely different new way. In this example, I tried to classify uh, seismic data, uh, separating them into uh, uh, different areas characterized by low gas saturation and high gas saturation. In this case, we had a well, so I, I was able to calibrate uh, my MIDI musical attributes extracted from seismic data uh, with the well uh, at well location, and then I uh, went through a, a supervised machine learning uh, workflow for classifying the remaining part of the data far away from the well using media attributes. Uh, let me show you what I mean by media attributes. For instance, this is a seismic trace, and this is a MIDI uh, virtual piano display of the seismic trace. Each individual small square in this uh, MIDI virtual piano display represent a musical MIDI note. And in red, you have high sound intensity. In blue, you have low sound intensity. So this is the music of the sound of the seismic trace. And you can listen to it in, on my, on my um, YouTube uh, channel, for instance. And this is an example of pitch histogram. So this is the pitch distribution of the same seismic trace extracted from the MIDI file. And you can see that there are many different uh, trends in this uh, musical seismic trace. So colors represent different pitches, different musical notes. And you can see that in correspondence with the low saturation or high saturation calibrated at well location, you have different trends, different rhythmic trends, different harmonic and melodic trends. So you can use these trends, this MIDI, attributes for classifying your data. And this is exactly what I did. And finally, I plotted the MIDI, um, the MIDI features, the MIDI, the, the MIDI attributes on the seismic trace, and I was able to separate the different parts of the seismic sections in terms of uh, different types of rocks and different types of saturations, high gas saturated saturated sands from low gas saturated sands or brine sands and so forth. So this is a very interesting example of how we can be creative and innovative using machine learning and combining, bridging different technologies. In this case, I used uh, sound engineering in, uh, for uh, combining it with uh, 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 geophysical data interpretation through machine learning. We can go also to, uh, even outside the field of uh, geophysics and ge geology. In, in this case, I used the same uh, principles, the same approach for uh, integrating cardiological instrumentation with digital music. Uh, this is a, a typical example of electrocardiogram. I transformed it into a MIDI file again with the same approach that I discussed before, 
and so I transformed into music my electrocardiogram. And then I used the MIDI attributes for classifying uh, and for interpreting and for analyze, uh, analyzing the uh, electrocardiogram. So it, it was a, a completely new approach for analyzing medical uh, information and for performing medical diagnosis. I did the same also uh, using again my machine learning platform for performing a classification and uh, analysis of human cells based on biological features. In this case, I was able to use machine learning for separating different types of human cells using uh, uh, biological attributes such as the shape of the cells, the size of the cells. And this is again another um, example of how we can be creative even outside the field of geosciences using machine learning. And this is the sense of cross-disciplinary machine learning. Again, a different field of application. Here I am applying neural networks and sound engineering for language analysis using similar um, types of analysis uh, in the frequency domain as we use in geophysics, but in this case applied to human language for characterizing different types of human languages using uh, sound engineering and neural networks. Again, another example to be creative. Uh, in this case, I use machine learning, sound engineering, and analysis of natural sounds for characterizing the sounds of uh, natural ecosystems. Coming back to geosciences, I can combine many different fields using machine learning, such as artificial intelligence and robotics, and sound engineering, even cognitive sciences, uh, computer-aided diagnosis in, in medical sciences. And all these technologies can be combined. I can take something from each one of these technologies for improving our analysis of geophysical and geological data. And so I invented this different type of geosciences that I call it augmented geosciences. Um, so the, the, the main message of this, of this uh, presentation is that we need to be creative and we can be extremely creative and we can even invent new disciplines by using our creativity with the support of, uh, of machine learning. And we can, can improve our business as well as our private life using machine learning, uh, creating hybrid technologies and so on. And I think that modern geoscientists, especially young people cannot ignore this ongoing revolution. So this was my last slide. These are um, several web references. You can find a lot of technical details on my uh, ResearchGate page on YouTube and on Amazon. 95% uh, of these things are for free. So I created and uploaded them on the, on, the, on the web exactly for you, especially for young people. You can download it and I hope that they can, all this information can be, can be useful for you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paolo, for this presentation. Very enlightening uh, and interesting. Uh, please, if you have any questions, type them into chat or, or raise your hand and we'll be happy to hear it. Uh, you know, it would be great to, to, to see uh, what questions the audience may have. If not, machine learning is up my street. It's something that uh, I would love to get deeper into. So I will ask one of the questions that. Okay, if there's no questions from the audience. I'll, I, yeah, Artem, go ahead. Yeah, I didn't want to uh, torpedo uh, young professionals and just <clears throat> if there is no question, probably can, I can ask uh, a quick one. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Paolo, for, uh, for a very interesting presentation. And I was impressed by the number of different methods you were using, like this random forest, naive bias, um, bias uh, um, neural networks and so on. So I was kind of um, intrigued, like, 
do you have an army of experts who are <laughs> running each method for you or how how can you do that uh, different methods and how do you know which method is appropriate for your data oh yes uh, uh, I, I like to to code in python and uh, you know that python is extremely helpful for this purpose and uh, I, I was able to create uh, my own learning platform, uh, including uh, many Python uh, libraries in my platform and uh, uh, using Python itself for linking all these uh, um, algorithms all together with each other in the same platform. It is uh, not very easy but not very complicated at the same time if you if you uh, know python because python is very mm, relatively easy to use and so using python i was able to create a very complex platform working in, in about one year in, in one year I was i created a platform including um, uh, about 10 methods that can run in parallel and uh, really in a few seconds using a, a simple laptop you can get uh, uh, wonderful classification results. Uh, let's say that uh, using a six, seven or eight uh, uh, algorithms at the same time, I can get a classification result in about one minute. Uh, and this is very, very useful because uh, I can test many different data at the same time, many different uh, 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 algorithms at the same time. It works very, very well. Okay, so you don't have an army. It was just great no, no, developed just, over, over a year. Yeah, okay. Just by just by myself uh, oh, yeah. in, in about one year work. Okay, yeah. Uh, and uh, about training these algorithms, so it requires some um, training data sets, I presume. So did you yes. synthesize them or did you get them from those supervised tagged uh, data sets? So? In, all, in all the examples that I showed in my presentation, I, I used the real training data sets. For instance, in uh, in the classification of well logs, I used about 10% of the data that were classified by a human expert, log anal uh, analysis expert. And uh, so in general, I used about 10% of the, the data as a training data set, and then I go through automatic classification for the remaining part of the data. But I can do also unsupervised learning and, and reinforcement learning using using the same platform. And uh, if you go to see my my draft books on ResearchGate, you can find also the Python codes that I wrote mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the appendix of the books. You can find a lot of material if you want to copy and paste the the, the, the codes. They are for free, so you can try by yourself if you like on your on your platform. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. And we have one question from the audience uh, yep. from Osama. If you would like to ask your question, so would you prefer if I read it out? I, I think the question is about would you recommend somebody to take a full university degree to learn how to be a machine learning specialist or would doing online courses on Coursera or online be enough in your experience? I learned by myself, so if I did that, everybody can do it <laughs> because uh, it is not very difficult. You can do by yourself, so you can teach yourself. This is another very important message of my of my presentation today. You can teach can teach yourself. You are the best teacher of yourself, and uh, I think I don't think that it is necessary to uh, follow a special specific uh, uh, university for learning uh, to program uh, in Python and to do machine learning by yourself. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Paolo. And now we are quarter past. So as per the program, uh, we'll take a 15 minutes break. So, you know, if you want to stretch your legs, if you want to grab a coffee, if you want to grab tea, uh, let's do that. And we will reconvene and half past to listen to our next presenter, Reda. So okay. let's take a 15 minute break and I will see you all back at half past. I'll use this opportunity myself as well to get a coffee. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. See you soon. Thanks.
We are half past. I will give people one minute to get back. I've managed to get my coffee. Have everybody managed to get something out of the break? If you're here, if you give me thumbs up with the reactions, does it stay? Yes. Wait a second. Good. Juliet is back. Reda is back. Good. Paolo is back. Okay. Karen. Okay. So we're one minute past. So we'll start with introducing our next speaker. So our final speaker of today, uh, before we go to the round table discussions, is Reda uh, Meftahi. He is a founder and director of Serve Intelligence, and he will speak about Earth observation and energy transition. So Reda is an innovative geoscientist with 25 years experience in the oil and gas industry. He has worked for oil majors, contractors, startups, and he understands the sector from every angle. Greta has been involved as an entrepreneur in a number of spin-offs from leading technical universities to develop cutting-edge technology. As a trained geologist, Greta specialized in structural geology and obtained an MSc in geophysics and geochemistry from the Institut de Physique to Globe de Paris. I hope that's good enough. Uh, uh, followed by an MSc of Structural Geology from University uh, Montplier too. Reda has an extensive knowledge of ground deformation that he collected through his experience in structural fault systems, passive micro seismicity, and seismic processing. In 2018, Reda founded Serve Intelligence, a startup in the ESA incubation program. The company has developed advanced geostatistical methods for the interpretation of Earth observation data. These are used for monitoring the structure integrity of underground reservoirs for the purpose of geothermal energy, hydrogen, and CO2 storage. Uh, let me welcome Reda to the stage with his presentation about Earth observation and energy transition. Reda, feel free to take the stage. Thank you, Adam, for this introduction. And hello, everyone. So I will share my screen now here yeah. so your screen. thank you all right so i, I think i'm i'm very happy to uh, come after um the the, the the good presentations that were before me from my colleagues um, because I want to emphasize on, on what has been said before in this presentation. U usually, I think uh, you are all afraid about what the uh, future uh, lies, uh, lies in for you. And uh, I'd like to tell you that I was in your situation um, several times. Actually, all along my career, I, uh, I experienced multiple crises of uh, our industry. And every time I had to look for another job. So looking for another job because the industry is in crisis is not the end of the world. And I don't think this uh, energy transition crisis will be the last one, actually. You, your, your role is either to uh, get better and stay in your position, keep your position by increasing your skills or increasing your skills and look for another position. So either ways, I think you can't escape getting better and educate yourself. And one way to do that, to, uh, to one way to do that nowadays is 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 learning a scientific programming with Python, like it has been said before. This is a a very powerful tool to help you uh, increase your your expertise and show off your skills. And having said that, let's get into the subject. How does space um, help the a geoscientist to? carry on on doing what he wants. Well, uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, space is, is divided into uh, two main categories, upstream and downstream, and your added value comes in the uh, consulting. Well, using space data, down to earth space data, 
It is used for many purposes uh, to check uh, the effect of uh, floodings, the quality of uh, the vegetation, the displacement of the ground, uh, possible subsidence and catastrophes. And I'm going to get into that. So uh, our niche was to find a way to understand uh, how the ground was moving and, and make predictions to avoid uh, problems for different industries, civil engineering, energy and even insurances are interested into the ground deformation. What we developed is a set of uh, um, skills and, and, and algorithm. And as you can see here, they're not very different from what you are doing probably every day. You uh, play with data. You have to condition this data. You have to quality control this data. It's signal processing mainly. Uh, you apply your uh, data analytics and model fitting skills. You um, evaluate some uh, attributes. In, in this case, it's a stress analysis and estima estimating the deformation. And you will have to do some predictions. So you use um, advanced statistics, uh, neural network, uh, AI, machine learning to predict what people want to know. And uh, this, this is what you do. Well, how space is could be interesting for a geoscientist or in the energy uh, domain because we can decompose this uh, information coming from the surface into vertical horizontal components. We can see um, we have to increase spatial resolution. We have to uh, make that signal um, better for interpretation. We have to do predictions, as I said. And we face a challenge nowadays. Uh, this is the main reason why the industry is, is in a bit of a turmoil. Uh, it's not very nice to say that we work in the oil extraction anymore. And I think, as you can see here, that um, we face a lot of uh, challenges at the surface of the earth because of this uh, climate change. There's a lot of uh, ground deformation, flooding and uh, dry seasons that we compact the uh, geological layers, which we'll call subsidence. And there are earthquakes because um, the operation, the subsurface operations of, of operating a reservoir structure, well, can create a lot of uh, overpressure, can create a lot of uh, cycle uh, deformation. Like in the Netherlands, in north of Netherlands, the gas exploration uh, created a lot of earthquakes and uh, also sinkholes. The, the, these catastrophes, um, impact different sectors, agriculture, uh, construction, transport, energy. But what you need to retain is that this also socioeconomic activity of energy, transport um, and construction will also impact the surface of the of the earth. We also cause ground deformation that will affect uh, society. People don't want their houses to be cracked. Insurance don't want to have too many claims and um, energy companies don't want to lose their their revenue by having uh, their operation shut down because people are complaining about uh, uh, problems of, uh, of of earthquakes and and fractures so from a, from a mode of uh, exploiting the the underground as as a, as a resource um, we are moving into a world where we have to preserve the uh, subsurface um, and and these uh, resources but your skills can be applied um, either way so if the industry is changing which is creating a crisis your, your skills can still apply now we talk about the energy transition and the storage of energy underground we talk about uh, salt caverns we talk about aquifers we talk about depleted reservoirs we talk about geothermal energy uh, to produce either heat or, or cold but all this will continue to uh, inter in, interact with the subsurface will continue to create uh, unexpected events we continue to have an impact on society this is where your skills will 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 have an impact this is where your skills will be applicable your skills will be applicable in the uh, change of the industry and it's not really a problem but it's an opportunity for you actually to um, to to position yourself
This is what I believe. And uh, new problems will occur, as I said, uh, pollution of aquifer, uh, unwanted migration of, uh, of uh, fluids uh, underground or subsidence created by any interference with the, um, with the environment. Now, how, 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 how do you fit? How would you fit in, in this environment? So space, uh, down to earth space, earth observation is, is a signal uh, that we obtain from satellite measurements. And I want to emphasize on signal. It, it, it is what you are used to, what you are used to see. It, it, there are problems of sampling, a mixed sampling on a time series. Uh, for, there's a problem of uh, interference. Uh, two, in this example, two satellites were used for generating this uh, uh, displacement time series and use, alternating between the two satellites created interference. So you had to detect that and remove it from the signal. Now, the signal also has um, different um, unwanted uh, um, features in it. So you will do some uh, signal processing to try to fit as, as, as best as possible to the interesting trends in the signal. But uh, what are you going to remove? What are you going to keep? This depends on your geosci geosciences skills. Uh, you're not going to have a, an engineer from, from the radar industry or the satellite uh, hardware industry to figure out uh, what is a real signal coming from a geological event and what is an uh, artifact coming from a acquisition or processing of that signal in, in, in the satellite at 700 kilometers on the top of your head. You uh, can make this data um, um, better by targeting uh, the linear component of this data to uh, understand the trends in the data by reducing noise. You can also look at the periodic uh, periodicity um, effect of this data by uh, reducing the noise, detecting the main events. This is the signal processing part, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this. This is there's no surprise to any, any of the uh, audience here. It is just applied in a different domain. Now, how do we express this? Uh, how do we present this deformation? Well, again, no surprise, um, mapping. We have to express uh, our learnings in, in maps in different layers. We have here a, a, a grid, a grid of the uh, subsidence where we see how the uh, some areas uh, are going down faster than some other areas and how it affects some structures. We had here an interest in uh, some bridges across roads and, and uh, railways, but it could be also a network or it could be an energy. We've lost you for a second, Reda. Reda, if you can hear us, it might make sense to maybe turn off the video. Give Red a few seconds to come back. Reda, can you hear us? Yeah, perhaps can you disconnect and connect again?
seems Freda is, has left and might have joined. Let's give him a few minutes. Apologies for this, the, the beauty of online meetings. Oh, brilliant. I can see Reda is back. I can uh, see you. Okay. I can hear you. Good. So I was saying that the interpretation of this sort of data is, is a regular geoscience interpretation. We want to know how the ground is moving around the object and how it is affecting the object. Now, this is, this is, of course, uh, this comes as a surprise uh, to the uh, civil engineering sector that with a satellite you are able to have that much detail in an in, in information about what is going on around that object. So we benchmark this uh, study with uh, instruments coming from the bridge itself. That um, uh, Reda, we cannot see your slides. Oops. Need to start sharing again. Ah yes, I quit. Okay, sorry for that. I'm back. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yes, thank you. We can see it now. All right. Yes, I was saying you benchmark this study with instruments coming from the bridge itself, and you can see that uh, there is a, a strong compliance be between the satellite interpretation and the uh, displacement and deformation on the bridge. This bridge was experimenting structural failure. And it's not, it's not enough to look at the bridge and uh, try to understand what is happening. This is just looking at symptoms. But if you want to know the cause of this deformation, you need to study the surrounding. So the interaction between the measurement on the bridge and the knowledge acquired with the satellite gives a, a good picture of uh, what is happening. I wanted to uh, say that um, ESA, the European Space Agency, Space Solutions, uh, more and more is um, interesting in the downstream application of uh, satellite data. They realize that uh, the collection of this, of, of a lot of data coming from the recent uh, satellite launches can have an application in different domain down to earth. And they created a lot of uh, uh, incubators around Europe, around the world, in order to stimulate the innovation in, uh, in, in this domain and in the application of this uh, satellite data. These are a few numbers uh, giving you an idea about how effective it is. But sp space is just one, um, one domain where you change industry, but you use your skills as a geoscient as geoscientist to express your, your, your expertise and help resolve a challenge. I think that the, the, uh, the, the, the most important message of my talk is, is that you, you have to look at the challenge that uh, the society and the industry is facing today. When you are afraid of uh, changing your position, you have to remember that your company or your industry is having the same fear. It has to adapt to a crisis, it has to uh, survive a crisis, and it, focus, it focuses its attention into their challenges, not into keeping their, uh, their, uh, their task force or, or, um, or making sure that their employees are happy. They focus on the business side of things and they want to reposition themselves to survive. You have to think this way, as well and either show how you could help your industry or your company to overcome these challenges by thinking uh, about the problems the new problems and how to say how to help or how to do that uh, with a proxy uh, how to transfer your skills to a different industry that would suffer the same challenge that your industry is suffering when I, I, I would recommend to pick your challenge, understand how you could apply your skills, and all you had to do then is to figure out how you will help your employer. And I said in the beginning that I, I could see a lot of opportunities in this uh, energy transition and all these uh, challenges we're facing here because this is a, a, a very good potential for creativity and innovation, but uh, I want, I want to emphasize as well that uh, 
a crisis is not the end of the world. Uh, you can build up a, cari- a career around uh, several crises. It's, uh, it's just a new beginning. And you shouldn't be afraid about a new beginning because it will bring you a lot of very interesting new development in a career. Thank you for your attention. I think, I, I don't know how I'm doing with the time, but uh, I've reached the end of the uh, presentation. Perfect. Thank you very much, Reda. So we have, uh, we can start a question session uh, for Reda. Are there any specific questions about Reda presentation? And thank you very much. That was really enlightening. I like your comment about treating it like a crisis as a as an opportunity uh, than something to to worry about uh, too much. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Okay, so in the meantime, I have, oh, Artem has a question. Yeah, I would, if uh, no one has a question, I, I, yeah. I, I wonder <laughs> uh, about the accuracy of these uh, subsidence data examples which you showed and availability for, let's say, for the UK, if I can find this data for my area and how precise, uh, how accurate this data might be. Yes, I think um, first we have to make a, a distinction between precision and accuracy. The uh, precision is a bit scary uh, when you realize that you can see a millimeter displacement. The, uh, the uh, displacement we could see in this example uh, that was uh, performed with the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure was about five millimeters per year to create the uh, structural damage on the, uh, on the, on the bridge. Mm-hmm. And uh, the satellite was able to pick up this uh, mil- relative displacement uh, of a millimeter precision. Now, concerning the accuracy, you uh, have to calibrate your data with some measurements on the ground to have um, something closer to the absolute measurement. And then you can reach a, an accuracy into the same, the same order between millimeters and centimeters, depending on the resolution of the satellite. So accuracy comes after heavy processing, heavy interpretation of that signal. And you can only estimate how accurate you are by benchmarking with uh, in-situ measurements. But okay, in all best possible technologies and with uh, everything, if everything is set up and processed correctly, we are talking about millimeters or millimeters a year. Yes. Yeah. And what about availability? Can I or someone else go to somewhere to the site or to the uh, to the internet and find this kind of data for my house, let's say, my property, uh, my street, my city. There is, I don't know about the UK, but uh, more and more, so the uh, European Space Agency, ESA, is uh, through a Copernicus program, is trying to make this data available. A lot of countries are starting to acquire this data and process this data and make it freely available in, in for the entire country. Germany does that, Netherlands does that, I think Denmark or Sweden are doing this. Uh, the UK is, I think, thinking about it, but uh, mm-hmm. not yet implemented. Otherwise, you go into the commercial application where you have to purchase the images from satellite providers. Yeah, okay, thanks. Are there any other data sets that would be available? So I remember we had a drunk conversation in a pub, you know, thinking about buying houses in London and seeing how, for example, the water levels are rising currently, you know, what the Thames level, are there other data sets that would be available through, uh, you know, image uh, from satellites and, and commercial applications for people to kind of look at investment properties or long-term insurance? Yes, absolutely. I mean. ESA and the Copernicus program is, is, are the key words. You, you have to Google that and, and discover that they have portals where they, they, they make um, optical images available, uh, radar images available, and you could, uh, you, could, you could build up your own uh, 
time series uh, from the uh, time you're interested in or the area you're interested in and, and download the pictures. So you, you could have access to this data and already have a pretty good idea of what's, go what's going on. They also have a platform that offers some uh, tools and some 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 of artificial intelligence, some 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 tools to to treat this data, to process this data, and, and get the first uh, a glimpse of uh, what's going on. While we're waiting for questions from the audience, my my, my kind of uh, interest is so right now you've spent twenty five years in oil and gas from from your bio but it seems the examples that you've used is from all from civil engineering how did you find you know yourself stepping into this area do you have any any tips and experiences to share transitioning from oil and gas to 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 more civil engineering applications well you see i'm 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 a geoscientist first and uh, civil engineering have their own way of doing things and I can see where geoscience can improve it. I spent a lot of time explaining to civil engineers that focusing on a very specific area does not give them the full picture of what is happening. Civil engin engineers don't have this um, understanding of how scale is important uh, to, to uh, tackle a problem, that you can have different effect at different scales that are not necessarily a good indication of what is is globally happening yeah i mean if you think about uh, fractures uh, you can have frac fracs at the scale of uh, a layer you can have a frax at the scale of uh, a, a kilometer it, it folds and they can be contradictory information they they, they can have different uh, dynamic different orientations and it depends at what scale you look, you, you, you can have a different interpretation. But if you look at every scale and understand how everything is, is uh, connected and integrated with each other, you, you start to have the good understanding of what's going on. A lot of industries like uh, uh, yeah, civil engineering or, or, or the insurance that also are interested in this type of information, they don't have this knowledge. They need help for that. Uh, this is where the geoscientists can help because it, this experience of uh, how to treat the problems in geoscience can be applied in different industries and in different domains. Yes, if I can add a comment. Yes, uh, I really like what Reda is saying uh, because I, I started my career in uh, 1988 in uh, civil engineering in a small uh, service uh, geophysical company and it was extremely useful for me to to work in that uh, domain uh, and then moving to uh, volcanology and then uh, into the oil business because comparing different scales different uh, problems working in different domains different with the different targets, different tasks, is extremely important for understanding, uh, uh, for being a, a real geoscientist. And so this is a suggestion for young people. Uh, try to find your job in uh, all the different uh, domains of geosciences, because each individual domain, from civil engineering uh, to oil business, is useful by itself and when you are able to combine the different experiences you will be a, a real geoscientist so it is very very important what you are saying Reda. yes i, I might add that uh, you know we talk about creativity innovation and and i think the most important ingredient here is curiosity scientific yeah. curiosity yeah absolutely we need to have the sense of exploration but in the general sense of this term, exploring everything we have around us in terms of opportunities, in terms of different domains of geosciences. So curiosity is combined with exploration sense and that is natural for human beings. So we need to, um, uh, to, to grow, uh, to increase our exploration and curiosity sense. 
and and to answer your your question um, before how how I got there, I can I can give you a, a, an anecdote that uh, that I think is 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 an important point. Um, uh, at at some time in my career, I was working for CGG, the uh, Compagnie Générale Géophysique, uh, based in Massy, and uh, it was one of the oil crises at the time, and uh, CGG had to downsize. So my position was made redundant, and um, I it was yeah the perspective was to quit CGG and and face a crisis and maybe not find another job in the uh, oil and gas industry. But then they were opening opening an office in in Dubai to promote the uh, the activity of the company in the Middle East. And uh, since I'm uh, yeah I'm I'm an, um, an Arabic speaker. I went to the management and say, well, if you haven't thought about who you're going to base there, I, I would be the ideal candidate. And uh, I, I, could, uh, I, could, I could fit with the culture and I have the, uh, the uh, geoscience experience. They didn't even think about it. So if I hadn't made myself the, uh, the effort to go there and say, uh, this is what you're planning, and uh, I am the the fit for that position. It wouldn't happen. So, then there you go. I was based in Dubai and continued my career in a different uh, in a different place. I think people need to be how to say um, uh, proactive in 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 the possibilities. Not be afraid of changing uh, position, changing countries, uh, ch changing companies. Uh, a job that is uh, being uh, threatened in a current uh, company doesn't mean it's the end of a career. Yeah, the other very important concept that you uh, explained, Reda, is uh, that uh, uh, crisis is not necessarily a bad thing. It is also an opportunity if you have an open mind. So this is, I think, an, another very important message for, for young people. I really appreciated that. I, I agree fully with you. Great. Thank you very much. Paolo, I have a question for you if there's uh, no questions from the audience. So you've, you've kind of tapped into, you know, different sections that are using sounds, you know, uh, medicine, music, yeah. et cetera. Uh, but do you feel it would make sense that our, our conferences are kind of around industry, right? It's an oil and gas conference. Do, did you ever explore tapping into conferences that are around, you know, sound or around acoustics or around data science itself? Do you think we could learn more if we kind of broaden our horizon outside of the industry? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. You mean uh, to apply the sounds in the, in the industry or I mean more, you know, in the data science domain, if yeah. you go to a conference, right, it's going to be oil and gas speakers speaking about data science in oil and gas. Yeah. How much is there to learn in other disciplines, you know, that we could bring back to our own? So, for example, are there applications in medicine that we could use in oil and gas? Yes, yes. I, I think that, uh, yes, I try to apply sounds in, uh, in, in medicine diagnosis and uh, uh, for for analyzing uh, um, electrocardiograms, and uh, then I on the opposite side I I brought uh, from medicine into the geophysical domains a lot of lesson learned from 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 medicine. So yes, absolutely, uh, using sounds uh, in uh, in medicine helped me to understand also in geophysics the importance of sounds for our interpretation. If you think about the seismic data, basically the physics of seismic is very similar to the physics of the sound. And uh, mathematics is the same, at least partially, and the physics is the same, at least partially. And so I, this was my job. I imported into the geophysical domain a lot of knowledge that I have acquired in sound engineering, because I am a sound engineer too, and so uh, I, I was able to to uh, to move uh, a lot of uh, te technical and technologies uh, from uh, from sound engineering into into geophysics. Uh, and uh, in, in my house, I created a, a personal studio, home studio, 
of, of sound engineering, and very often I use it for analyzing seismic data. <laughs> <laughs> it works very well. I published the several papers about that. Huh? <laughs> you can find also in geophysical geophysical prospecting, uh, first break, uh, leading edge, several papers published by me or by my colleagues with me uh, about that. Brilliant. It's um. I think I don't know if if something if it's something well known everywhere or if it's just uh, known by a few. But the, um, the the science, the physics, and the science uh, has been shared by different industry all the time. We see the mathematicians working in uh, in uh, geophysics and uh, and the geosciences moving to the finance industry because yeah. the mathematics are the same. Uh, the the exchange between medicine and geophysics. Um, always happened in the beginning the ge geophysics of the oil and gas was more advanced and borrowed by the uh, medicine industry and now the echography and the imaging in the in in the medicine is far more superior to everything you see in the uh, geophysics that's it always yeah it always go in in, in all the ways um i see a, a big uh, move towards uh, digitalization for 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 the medicine people are building sensors that you can keep on on yourself that are measuring a lot of information uh, blood pressure oxygen quality heartbeats and 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 many more that i'm not aware of but what does that mean that means a constant feed of data which is basically what a a drilling engineer will look at uh, with the constant logs coming to his station yeah and trying to make sense of that so yeah. You can apply uh, log analysis to um, sensor analysis to check if a person is in good health or if a person can have a problem or predict if the problem can happen. So possibilities are everywhere. If you are confident with your skills and you, are, you have a, this will to, to be curious, there are many sectors where they could be appreciated. Yeah, in fact, uh, it is called computer aided uh, diagnosis uh, medical diagnosis and uh, I, i'm studying that field because uh, it is extremely expiring for building uh, uh, python platforms machine learning platforms that then we can apply in, ge in geology and geophysics uh, i in my presentation in fact i, I showed a, a couple of slides uh, extracted uh, from my computer hided diagnosis medicine uh, that I use also for uh, classifying well logs or seismic data. The principles are exactly the same and uh, so this is exactly the sense of cross-disciplinary yeah. and it, it can be very very useful for young people but also for not young people and it is the core of creativity so bridging the different fields. And, and one thing I'd like to add is um, because of this digitalization and the social media development, it is so easy for someone to show off, not show off, but uh, present their, their, their expertise. Yeah. Like, uh, exactly, like Paolo did. Uh, he's talking about a YouTube channel, yeah? Uh, if, you, if, you, if you're looking for a position, if you want to make yourself valuable to an industry or to a job position, what what stops you from from showing what you're capable of doing today it's so easy we we don't show our diploma anymore when we look for 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 position we show what we can do and how we can help yeah communication and sharing uh, our job is an important part of our work and uh, i strongly encourage uh, young people to uh, to use uh, YouTube, to use, but, but they do that better than me, uh, to, to use YouTube channels, to use social media, LinkedIn, ResearchGate, um, uh, Amazon, uh, everything, because uh, and this is another very important suggestion for, for, for young people. We need, they need to be manager of themselves yeah. and a, a good manager uh, is very pay a lot of attention to the communication uh, with other people. 
so sharing uh, the, the, the work and uh, the attitudes and so on on the web. So this is a very important suggestion. Share and communicate about your work on the media. I'm still waiting for questions from the audience. So if there's anything that pops up in the meantime, you know, um, I, I have plenty of questions of my own, but I'm a petroleum engineer by background. So they are not very deep into geoscience, but a question I have is for Artem. So Artem, you have, you have a PhD. You've worked for a long time as a researcher across different areas. How does it help you in your career? Is it a option that you would encourage young people to do? I know you, the last time oil price crashed, I was Googling every PhD I could find before I found my job. So that's that's always something that is on people's mind uh, if it's something that can add to their career. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, from my perspective, like uh, to step into the PhD, it was not a career decision. It was just more like entertaining because uh, of the nature of the profession of geophysicists where you combining exciting field works and uh, traveling experience and acquiring data in some interesting geological sites somewhere plus after that and and you're getting paid for that and after that you're getting back to your uh, research office and processing this data and writing something about them and publishing and then as a bonus you're going to a conference so it's kind of it was no reason not to not to take this option uh, so th that was uh, that was the background motivation for that uh, to to get PhD, but but then later on, so this uh, title of having PhD, it's uh, I don't know, uh, it, it's just it's just a line in the CV, which in some occasions it may help to get your job. In some occasions it may uh, refrain uh, hiring managers from that. Okay, well we don't want any academicians here. We want a practical, hands-on approach. People uh, for this job. We don't want all this. Uh, uh, people who are just talking and, and uh, theorizing about uh, the uh, aspects of our job. We want the job to be done. Uh, on on that side, uh, I can say this, yes. From uh, from the academic point of view, you have so, some tendency to get a bit theoretical and uh, less um, hands-on. But from this, from my geophysical background point of view was very practical going into the field acquiring the data processing the data interpreting it publishing it and to make things published it's to get job done so this is uh, this is the one of the aspects to showing that you are able to do something you are able to achieve something by delivery so let's say publications or uh, master thesis or bachelor thesis or phd thesis in uh, that respect is uh, also a manifestation that you can deliver, you can do something. And then on the aspect of um, uh, skills uh, transferability, I also had experience of uh, switching from seismic, from geophysics into, uh, into NDE. Uh, NDE is a non-destructive evaluation where using acoustic um, energy to detect for any damages, corrosion in industrial scale structures and emission critical structures like pipelines or walls of nuclear reactors or something else where you cannot afford this device or this structure to fail. So if the device or if the item is not that expensive, like a, a spoon, then you don't really care. You just produce another hundred of spoons, another thousand of spoons. You don't invest in analyzing the quality of, of uh, a particular object. But if it is a uh, mission critical, then you are trying to employ as many optimal testing capabilities as you can. So of course, the state of the art, like what we have in medicine is X-ray. This is the best resolution and uh, uh, best contrast. So now probably in medicine, if we're talking about medicine, that X-ray is ready with substituting by the uh, computer tomography. But the limitations there is that you need to put the object into the testing device. With ultrasound, similar to seismic experiments, you are putting your equipment around the object you are testing. 
So there is no option, if we're talking about nuclear reactor or pipeline, to put it inside. Uh, well, of course, you can, and capacity, you can uh, put the array of a transducer around the pipeline and use different uh, types of energy. So you can put the transducer around it and you can, um, in, uh, you can um, excite uh, surface waves or uh, guided waves inside the pipe. So you are putting your sensor in one location, but you are testing quite extended section of the pipeline. And uh, when I transferred from seismic processing into this um, research project at Imperial College, where I was using uh, this ultrasonic measurements, first I thought, okay, well, yeah, suitable, kind of related subjects, related physics, related mathematics. I know something about it. Uh, but when um, I first saw the multi-sensor array data, uh, the ultrasound, I was absolutely shocked how similar it is to seismic. It is basically seismic data acquired on a centimeter scale. Moreover, the exciting, uh, another exciting step was that you can do it in real time and you can process it in real time. So you're taking your multi-sensor array, you're hovering or you are sliding it over an object, that's the object you tried to, to analyze, and you are instantly getting 3D image or if you're taking um, sparse uh, 3D ultrasonic array, um, you can uh, get an instant 3D image of the subsurface. So, so it's like basically like instantly look through a wall. And that was quite exciting, but the, all the physics and all the background information is exactly the same as we use in geophysics. But the data is so cheap, so therefore, uh, in contrast to very expensive seismic experiments where you are like a field campaign is like a hundred thousands, millions of dollars question. So there to acquire the data uh, to play with costs nothing, it's peanuts. So therefore the consequences there, even for the mathematics and the physics are exactly the same, it's a wave equation. But the redundancy of the data and the, its cheapness, its availability uh, gives you gives you more options to play to combine the data in a more redundant way, which is no way you can achieve in geophysics. So even though um, my message is that even though the principles are the same, the practicalities and the thinking and actually the mindset of people from different backgrounds like civil engineering, non-destructive evaluation engineers or geophysicists, they might be different. So to get from geophysical mindset into the engineering on destructive relation mindset, it might be eyes opening like to widen your horizons. It's like uh, similar to what um, uh, Reda mentioned uh, earlier, like civil engineering, maybe they are focused on a more local problem of the street or of a bridge, but they don't have mindset of looking at the broader picture. So I have an opposite uh, experience like in geophysics, in geophysics, we have very precious, very expensive data and we try to apply all possible sophisticated processing algorithms to clean this data and to extract as much as we can from this very expensive data set. On the ultrasonic uh, data set, like the data is almost free and you kind of, you solve the same problem, you're getting ex extensive uh, efficiency or extensive resolution by simply acquiring more data. The problem is solved <laughs> in a different way. <laughs> and of course, it's not only seismic and it's not only uh, acoustics. There in engineering, they're using uh, electromagnetic methods. They're using eddy currents to induce um, uh, skin effect, uh, to induce uh, skin uh, currents, which will uh, uh, by using the Lorentz uh, force and will induce some mechanical excitation using the electric eddy currents into the uh, metallic uh, components, metallic specimens. And in that way, it might be some, somehow similar to, to other electromagnetic methods which we use in geophysics. So it is not only seismic to ultrasonics, it is more wide than that. So th that was my experience and uh, maybe a bit uh, long uh, answering to a question to get uh, or not to get into the um, into 
to get this uh, PhD position. I think generally it helps to understand how the science works and how the mindset of academic people works. But um, if it is really a game changer in terms of getting work, um, I don't know, maybe in some aspects, but maybe not in, other, in the others. So that that's what <laughs> my opinion is about this. Brilliant. I, uh, I wanted to add uh, uh, that uh, the cost that was mentioned, um, it, it's an important factor into finding a, a job as well. Because what, what the crisis brings is that we go, we, industry companies will try to do the same thing at a lower cost. And they will switch to a technology that would help them to achieve that goal. So a crisis means the technology evolves, the technology changes, or the methodology changes with this effort of uh, reducing the cost. And this is a big potential for young professionals because well, old professionals are close to retirement and they don't, they're not going to think about this. <laughs> they're going to focus about exiting properly and uh, focusing on, on their hobbies. But the young professionals, they will have the target of figuring out how to achieve that goal, how, how to do the same, well, how to achieve the same results, but with a, with a lower cost. Either changing technology or being more efficient with the existing technology or importing technology from a different industry. And for a young professional, it is very important to be on the lookout, to, to scan what is possible, what is similar, what could be replaced, something costly. But, but the activity will carry on. The possibility is to find a, a company that comes with a good solution and wants to expand is a good opportunity for a young professional. Uh, this is a new career position. Apply, apply, apply your skills uh, differently uh, to achieve exactly the same goal because actually there is a demand in the industry to have lower cost. Thank you very much, Reda. That's really useful. And thank you, Artem. Uh, for me, I didn't think PhD might be so entertaining as you described. I think the engineering PhD positions are a bit less entertaining from what I've read. Uh, well, I, I cannot say about all PhDs, maybe a PhD in mathematics may be extremely boring to sit on uh, with the formulas and uh, try to um, to derive something, but PhD in geophysics, it is super entertaining. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Uh, I think my next question would be to Paolo. Paolo, you, you, you have a lot of hobbies, you have a lot of innovation. How do you find time for creativity? How do you find time to, you know, to tinker with something? I sleep just three hours a night. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, it is just, um, it is not a question of time. It is a question of enthusiasm, I think. If you like doing uh, different things and combining them, you can find the time. Yes, I have a family, uh, so I have to dedicate my time also to my family, but uh, my strong enthusiasm in doing all these things uh, support me every day in working very hard. Uh, every time I can, I, I spend my personal time in creating something new, in, uh, co in connecting things, uh, linking technologies, creating uh, some new technology, uh, also outside the, the the boundaries of my job, and so expanding myself into different uh, disciplines, including medicine, cognitive sciences, art, music, uh, sound engineering, and so on. But the question is not time. The question is uh, is uh, uh, to have enthusiasm. The other very important answer to your question is. Uh, you can do all that if, if you have uh, uh, the tools. So if you have a good toolbox uh, in terms of uh, mathematical, uh, statistical and computing um, technologies, you can do a lot of things in, in a very small uh, time window. So when I, when I talk about toolbox, I mean, for instance, coding capabilities, uh, such as Python, C++, Fortran, and I, I, I teach myself to, to, to program in different languages. And if you have a, a big toolbox uh, in terms of uh, programming languages, you can do a lot of things 
many, many things in a small time window. So this is the other important uh, technical aspect of my many hobbies and interests. Brilliant. Thank you, Paolo. You're very That's welcome. very useful. Yeah, especially about, you know, coding. I, I, I know that, you know, I know a bit of Python, a bit of, you know, a dirty secret of VBA, but sometimes you, you have something that you would spend six hours on and you can, you know, do a little bit of code and save yourself time if, if you don't have to work it. Uh, yes, Python, uh, C++, I think at the moment are, and also Java, uh, these are very useful uh, tools for for doing many, many things in a small time window. Brilliant. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, my next question would be to Reda. So Reda, you have worked for 25 years, you know, now you're an entrepreneur. Uh, that's something that I think many people dream now, you know, looking at the news and the all those millionaires. Uh, would you think when is the good time to make that transition to sometimes, you know, work on your own? Which skills you should pick up before you're able to step out of, of organization? Or do you even need to be an organization to become an entrepreneur? So I tried many times. It's, it's not my first attempt and uh, it's my third attempt. The first two failed. And the first two failed because I was on my own. If there is a, a message today about becoming an entrepreneur is that you can't do everything by yourself. You need a team. Um, I'm, I have an experience in sales. I'm, I'm a geoscientist. Uh, I'm not a, a lawyer or a, a, a banker. And uh, the finance, financial aspect uh, of creating a, a, a business is very important. You, you need to have beside you people who know what they do that you can trust. Today, um, well, I've been around for uh, since 2018, and this is because of the team, because everyone has his specific uh, task and everyone knows what he's doing. So there is no perfect moment. Well, there is a perfect moment to create a, a business is a crisis. The crisis is the perfect opportunity for creating a business. People are in panic. They don't know what to do. Uh, everybody wants to save money and they're looking for the magic technology that will solve all their problems. So also a lot of people are investing in research. Uh, they are, they are investing in possibilities to overcome the future crisis. The government is participating in uh, heavy industries participating. So there is access to funding, there is access to, to support, and there is also the possibility to come up with a solution uh, that everybody will be satisfied with. So yeah, the right time is, is really a crisis time because with the challenge comes uh, opportunities. Brilliant, thank you, Reda. So we're reaching the end of the time. We have two minutes, so maybe I would ask for a closing sentence what you would advise young people to do uh in the coming years so maybe let's start with <laughs> autumn then paolo and then we'll finish with reda and we'll close the session autumn um my advice is simple don't be afraid and just go to do what you like uh, just try to apply to as many jobs uh, as you can but of course uh, every not every job will suit you and you will not be suitable for every job. So if in your current applications, you will get like 10% um, acceptance, like invitation to the interview, this is very good. And out of this 10% uh, of interviews, if you will get 1% uh, of, uh, of um, offer, this is very good. So this is, this is good. And don't be discouraged by all these rejections. Because obviously, if you didn't get the job, then uh, there is always opportunity to get the next one, which will be even better. Because for some reason, that the previous one didn't suit you. So, in a in a short summary, don't be afraid. Just carry on. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Autumn. Paolo. Yes. Three main suggestions. First of all, be creative and enthusiastic. Um, so explore your possibilities inside of you and uh, be enthusiastic enjoy what you do 
and uh, uh, try to be creative as much as possible. The second very important point is expand your toolbox as much as possible in terms of programming capabilities and uh, physics, mathematics, statistics. So uh, try to expand your toolbox. The third and final suggestion is be a good manager of yourself. So try to use the social media, uh, the YouTube, uh, ResearchGate, uh, LinkedIn, in order to uh, keep in contact with uh, people in your area of business. This is a very important point. So communication and sharing what you do, what you are with the other people and with your scientific community. So be a good manager of yourself. Perfect. Thank you, Paolo. And Freda? Sure. Um, I think, yeah, what I would add is don't take no for an answer. You, you don't know how things work when you apply for a job. You could have been filtered by HR. It will have never reached the person of interest, or it would be also an interest that is not even expressed. So if you hear about the job, you apply, you get rejected. It doesn't mean that a couple of days later, you apply again, you won't be accepted. I mean, it works for me. I believe it could work with, with anyone. You, there's different ways to access into, into a position in a company. It, sometimes it's not, it's, it's, it's not with the job that was ad advertised. And so my, my advice is if you want to get somewhere, try and try again and don't, don't take rejection as, as the end of, 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 of the time, because it, it's, it's all about reaching the right person at the right time and Companies are so complex that you never know how this information travel inside and, and where it gets lost. So try and try again. That's my advice. Perfect. Thank you very this much. Also Reda. Shows the importance of uh, personal networking, just to get your message through, through yeah. the wall. Perfect. Thank you, Artem. Thank you, Reda. Thank you, Paolo. Apologies for keeping everybody up two minutes of a time. Uh, but this discussion was so good that I couldn't, I couldn't end it prematurely. Uh, thank you all for attending and uh, happy to close the, the meeting here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you thank very much you for organizing. Thank Hope you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you all.